maybe let me uh, say that it's a pleasure to um, introduce Michael Eisenman as our final speaker for the year. Um, uh, Michael doesn't really need an introduction, but since it's customary in this uh, seminar to give one, let me briefly mention that uh, he's a professor of mathematics and physics at Princeton, uh, that his list of honors is way too long for me to read, uh, and that he's particularly known for his uh, deep structural insights in statistical physics, among many other things. And he will present one of such, uh, one of these uh, deep insights today uh, and uh, in the, his talk on the triviality of the phi four theory in four dimensions. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, let's see, I, I'm glad also to see the Sure. The participants. Uh, I don't know how we should run it, but I, I think that it may be safe to allow people to interact with questions. If, if you would like to, at least, uh, I presume you would unmute yourselves, ask a question, and if there would be too many of those, we would see how to proceed. Okay. So, um, I'll talk about the, the recent results. Uh, derived with Hugo de Menil Copan on the marginal triviality of the scaling limits of the uh, four dimensional uh, critical easing and 544 uh, models. Um, so, uh, as I cannot a, see your iPad anymore. I think, did it get oh. disconnected? Okay, that is a problem. Periodically, uh, I see. Uh, yeah, usually when it goes on sleep, uh, at some point you have to reconnect it. Yes, uh, yes. It unfortunately happens. Actually, let me do the following. Let, uh, it's a delaying the beginning for by a minute, but let me, let me try to solve this problem at the root. Uh, uh, no, I guess that would be too complicated. So if it ever, if it happens again, please let me know. And I will have to uh, re restart the sharing. Okay, is it? Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. So uh, here is the uh, synopsis of the of the talk. Um, so we would discuss uh, the fact that in four dimensions, the spin fluctuations of uh, easing type models at their critical point are Gaussian in the scaling limit. The limit consists of infinite volume and vanishing lattice spacing. Now the statement covers in particular the scaling limits of phi four fields constructed through the removal of lattice cutoffs. So the, the topic is really of interest from a dual perspective of statistical mechanics and the field theory. Uh, a particular tool which facilitates the proof is the system's random current representation, which I should uh, briefly outline here. Um, it's one in which the correlation of the, fun of the model are, ex are given a stochastic geometric representation and in it, the deviations from Weak's law, uh, which characterizes Gaussian behavior, are expressed in terms of intersection probabilities of random currents with prescribed sources. So all these terms should be, would be explained uh, in, in this lecture. I want to say that this approach is not entirely new. It was previously used to produce such results for the uh, uh, convergence to Gaussian of the uh, scaling limit of critical models in dimensions greater than four. Um, D equal four, as I would explain in greater detail, was sort of on the horizon, but the previous methods could not uh, handle this marginal case. And the reason I'm talking is that uh, today is that uh, the recent, is that uh, recently uh, was an additional uh, ingredient added to that. Uh, and with the, uh, help of multi-scale analysis of the intersection of critical clusters, the basic result was extended to the marginal dimension four. So all I'm saying, I mean, this part is joint work with the Hugo Dominil Copan. So as I said, the subject is of uh, 
uh, dual interest in, as a result in uh, describe, uh, addressing the critical behavior and statistical mechanics, but it's of relevance for field theory. So the two subjects have shared mathematics, though different goals and perspectives. And I'm really delighted to give the talk in a seminar, uh, the series of analysis, quantum fields and probability, because my mind goes back to uh, sometime in the 80s when I gave a lecture, I was invited to give a talk on the results uh, which existed then for d greater than four by a uh, distinguished uh, mathematician, a central figure of mathematics. Uh, and uh, after the lecture in a private chat, uh, I was asked, I was told, that's very nice, but could you make it into analysis? Uh, the flavor of my presentation was probability. So could you make it into analysis? And I'm very glad that here I do not have to make this, uh, this choice. It's a seminar on analysis, quantum fields, and probability. Uh, so uh, as I said, the, this is a dual, there is a dual perspective, field theory and statistical mechanics. So let me start from that. I, I, I would like to explain the, the question and uh, the background for that. So, so in the Euclidean field theory, and I see uh, quite a number of experts on the subject in the audience, uh, uh, in Euclidean field theory, the search is for a well-defined uh, functional integral, uh, which describes, well, not a random function, because it's now understood that this would not be functions, uh, but rather distributions, but a distribution phi, Think of it initially as a function, but it won't be. Phi of x, which is a random object, a random function, if possible, or distribution, whose probability distribution uh, is, roughly speaking, of the form described here. Uh, namely, the expected value of any functional, f of phi, should be given by integral of f of phi against possible realization of this object phi of x, this function, uh, where the measure has a Gibbs-like factor e to the minus, where it could be the action or Hamiltonian h of phi. Uh, and this is a product uh, over the sites d phi x. So this is just the, uh, th this is a prob somewhat problematic expression on the form on formal grounds, and the question is how to make it uh, uh, meaningful and how to make it work. Now, the uh, Hamiltonian, which is written here, of interest would be would have the structure of a quadratic term uh, listed here plus a, a polynomial uh, in uh, in the variables phi, uh, where phi to the power greater than two, say 2k, normal ordered, is heuristically interpreted as a, as a local, very local, ultra local k particle interaction. So a non-interactive example of such functional integrals is obtained by uh, initially omitting this polynomial and just uh, keeping h, uh, uh, let, letting h be a quadratic form. In particular, if you want it uh, the interaction to be local, also the action to be local. Uh, and, and natural starting point is the uh, quadratic form, which is the uh, Laplacian uh, uh, plus uh, integral of uh, phi x square over the space. Now, if that's all you there is here, that's actually a well studied. Uh, uh, random distribution, well, before I get to that, uh, I should say, what is a random distribution? Well, uh, in this average, the functions of the random variable, which are of interest, would be smeared, uh, smeared variables of the form uh, uh, integral of the distribution against a smooth function, say continuous compactly supported function f of x, and that would be noted by t sub f of phi. This is the collection of random variables which, would, which in the limit should have a well-defined distribution, hopefully. 
Now, uh, the purpose of the of the slightly formal expressions like what was uh, what's given here is to explain various relations uh, uh, which emerge of this uh, such expectation values. The most elementary of this is that the expectation value of products of such variables by linearity would be given by uh, integral uh, dx1 up to dx endpoints of the, of the product of the functions times uh, a weight which is uh, independent of the function f. And these are the Schwinger functions of the model or in statistical mechanics, this would correspond to the correlation functions of the field or spin at, at these sites. Now, the Gaussian fields are characterized by the by Weeks law, which is that the correlation function or Schwinger function it just depends on which uh, field, whether you are talking language of statistical mechanics or field theory. Uh, for Gaussian fields, this measure is completely characterized by just the two-point function. Um, once you know that, you know everything else. In particular, the endpoint function, where n is even, so two endpoint function, is given by sum over pairing permutations. And for each pairing, so perhaps I should describe what is pairing permutation here. Uh, if you have a collection of variables, uh, so if you have collection of sites, excuse me, x1, x2, no, that's still too big. Uh, x1, x2, x3, and so forth. The correlation function of the fields at those sites is given by summing over possible pairings, for example, x1 with x3, x2 with x4, and summing over all such pairings of these variables. And for each pairing, you take product of the corresponding uh, two-point functions. So one thing which emerges from that is that obviously, as soon as you know the two-point interaction, the two-point function, you know all of them, there's no additional information needed. And that corresponds also with this picture that this describes a non-interacting uh, field theory. So due to the algebraically simple structure and the fact that there is really no interaction, such fields have been referred to as trivial. And a goal of constructive field theory was to, uh, to develop mathematical machinery, which would allow one to make sense of such, such measures on function space or more precisely distribution space, which are not Gaussian. The, the action H has terms which go beyond the quadratic. Um, the main result is that uh, addresses the question of whether the natural methods to approach that produce uh, trivial or non-trivial results. And the result is that in high enough dimension, including the marginal case of the equal four, the, uh, the method you have descri described here does not produce uh, such interesting results. So a word about past constructive and past no-go results. So a natural step for reaching beyond Gaussian case is to include the, well, the, the next, the, the lowest degree polynomial, which should be even for the integral to, to be convergent. Uh, so you go into to phi fourth, which is essentially the polynomial of this form, some multiple lambda of phi to the fourth minus constant phi square. Uh, in one dimension that can be done, no problem with that. Um, in fact, the one dimensional case of this Gaussian measure is of course the celebrated Wiener integral over random functions. And as you know, the typical realization of uh, what's referred to as Brownian motion, the one real variable is time, uh, uh, is actually a continuous function, although uh, very rough. Uh, uh, it has some degree of Hausdorff continuity, but it's, it's not differentiable. The fact that it's not differentiable is an example of uh, uh, why uh, this formula should be taken with a grain of salt, because uh, even though going back to the, to the defining 
uh, the, to the formula we started with, even though the existence of high gradients is suppressed by the uh, by this factor, it's not enough. And in fact, uh, although proper limit of this can be defined, uh, it so happens that the integral of grad phi square is in fact infinite for almost every realization. So as I said, this formula has to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, but that's a well studied problem. And we try now to go beyond that uh, by adding the fourth degree polynomial. In, in dimensions greater than one, uh, so, so as, as I said, in one dimension, this is doable. In dimensions greater than one, this creates problems. Now, a natural way to construct such functional integrals is to introduce a pair of cutoffs. Uh, the short distance or ultraviolet cutoff would be instead of starting immediately with functions defined over the continuum, you discretize the space, let restrict the spatial variable x to the vertices of a rather dense lattice. So it's a lattice A, Z to the D. It's a lattice of lattice spacing little a here. Um, that immediately gets resolved certain issues having to do with the differentiability because it replaces the, the derivative by the uh, dif difference uh, suitably uh, normalized. Uh, and that's well defined. And also, before you jump to an infinite system, we'll start with an infrared, which is the long distance cutoff, which is a restriction to a finite domain. So basically, the, the uh, analysis will be now restricting to domain lambda, which is minus r, r to the d. And then within this box, we, we uh, consider the uh, a graph of lattice spacing A. With these cutoffs, the integral is now perfectly defined. And the question would be to consider its limits. The limits are where the cutoffs are removed. R goes to infinity, lattice spacing goes to 0. And in the process, one should allow the parameters lambda and b to be adjusted so as to stabilize the, the uh, correlation functions, like the two-point function between x1, x2. So just to be clear, in this limit, we uh, one way to think of it is, well, actually, there, as always, there is more than one way of thinking about this. In field theory, you are naturally thinking about trying to construct a functional integral for functions over continuum, so your sites are fixed, and the lattice is uh, spacing is shrunk to zero. From statistic mechanical perspective, if you start by focusing on the lattice scale, um, what you are interested in then is uh, looking at larger and larger distances uh, 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 in terms of the original uh, lattice scale. The lattice scale uh, it would naturally be essentially the scale of on which the shortest uh, the, 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 the fundamental variables of the model are formulated. So uh, naturally, along this way, as you approach this continuum infinite system limit, uh, by adjusting the parameters uh, of the Hamiltonian of, the, of this uh, action, lambda and b, in effect, you are produce adding counter terms. And there are other ways to handle this. Instead of lattice spacing, there are other ways of uh, in introducing scale decomposition. The process which I uh, alluded to uh, can be viewed as a, uh, in terms of a normalization group flow. There are yet other approaches like the theory of regularity structures of uh, uh, the, the, let's see. Uh, yeah, like the theory of regularity structures on which I'm sure you heard much more. Um, now, Physical heuristics based on the analysis of small perturbations of the Gaussian case uh, indicate that this approach should work in dimensions two and three, uh, where the theory is super anomalizable. There is a certain basic uh, dimensional counting, which we would see uh, uh, 
in few transparencies from here, uh, which explains why why four uh, is a relevant uh, dimension, marginal dimension. So for the low dimensions two and three, the challenge of carrying such analysis uh, has been met with considerable success, although not goals have been accomplished yet. So let me now uh, say a word about the mar marginality of four dimensions. So uh, the constructive uh, field theory program uh, succeeded in yielding non-trivial scalar field theories uh, with action having five to the fourth terms uh, in two and three dimensions. And I refer here to the series of works by Glyn Jaffe, Osterwalder Schrader, Guerra, Rose and Simon, Bridges, Frederick Spencer, and so forth. Um, however, the constructive results uh, progression, I mean, initially they, the, the, this, uh, this effort was uh, presented as aimed at arriving with a constructive program in four dimensions. And uh, this progress was halted when it was proven in 81, 82, that in dimensions D greater than four, the approach which uh, I roughly outlined yields only Gaussian fields. The approach is, uh, well, let me take a step back from that. Um, if, you, if you bear in mind that in the lattice formulation, you have short distance interactions, one should remember that in statistical mechanics, when you, if you take a generic model uh, with short distance, finite range couplings on the lattice, and then ask what's the correlations at distances much larger than that, then unless the parameters are fine-tuned to be in the vicinity of a critical point, the interactions are kind of trivial. They, they are not meaningful over large distances. At high temperature, the correlations decay exponentially in terms of lattice spacing, which means that if you study correlations on large distances in terms of the lattice, you would not, well, they, they, they would not be, uh, they would not have interesting structure of the type that we are interested in. Uh, the same is true in low temperatures, except that then there may be the phenomenon of long range order, but still the, the covariance between variables on the lattice typically decays exponentially, except when one is at the critical mode, critical, in the vicinity of a critical point, uh, in which case the correlation length may diverge. Well, actually, uh, of course, another famous exception of this is the costeritz tauless uh, transition where you have a whole line of critical points, but criticality of some sort is essential for, uh, for continuum limit to be uh, uh, not entirely obvious uh, in StatMex setup. So what from the field theoretic perspective is uh, viewed as uh, uh, removal of terms to produce a convergent result. In statistical, from statistic mechanical perspective, what you are doing really is approaching the critical point of the model and really prodding the correlation functions on distances of huge correlation length. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, of huge scale, uh, uh, which should be less or equal than the correlation length. Now, uh, so as I said, uh, uh, the, the results proven by uh, me and Freudich independently, uh, or, or this short succession, uh, were that in dimensions greater than four, this uh, process would yield only Gaussian fields. And various partial results have indicated that a similar no-go statement may hold true also for the critical, for the equal four. As I said, for the less than four non-trivial continuum theories were constructed. So four is clearly a transitional dimension. Uh, to cite some, some of, the, of these works, well, uh, there was a paper with Ross Graham, uh, my student at the time, then Aragao, Carvajal, Froelich, around the same time, 
Gavetsky Kupiainen, Hara and Tasaki, and much more recently, Bauer Schmidt, Bridget and, Bridges and Slade uh, did beautiful analysis uh, of, the, uh, of the logarithmic corrections which pop up in four dimensions. Uh, and again, the scaling limit would be, would be Gaussian, but with logarithmic corrections which are of interest. Uh, and uh, if I understand correctly, the, the, the works which could be carried out were carried uh, for five or fields which are sufficiently soft. Uh, I would explain this and uh, explain the link of that with the, the easing model, which is the hardest case. So still, as I said, the sweeping statement, like what was proven for D greater than four, four has remained open. And this was closed in our recent work with uh, Hugo Dominique Copin and all the details, which I, I will not go over all, all the details of this work, but it's available on the archive. So I started by, since I started with the summary of the field theoretic perspective, let me now switch gears and switch to the statistic mechanical view on that, and then try to put the two together. So uh, a basic model of phase transition is the easing model, actually a, uh, an earlier, our earlier encounter with phase transition could be from the studies of uh, things like water or ice, the H2O, stuff made of, H2, made of H2O. Here is a phase diagram uh, of that. Uh, the relevant thermodynamic parameters are temperature and pressure. And as you will know, the phase diagram looks like that. There is the regime of ice at low enough uh, temperatures or high pressure. Um, then there is the water phase, vo vapor phase, and the boiling phase transition occurs as you cross uh, this line in the parameter space. But there is this magic point, uh, which we, it's not part of our everyday experience, but if you explore it to higher temperatures and pressures, it turns out that you can actually travel in the phase diagram and reach from water to vapor uh, state without passing through any phase transition. And if they, they deform continuously if you take a path around this point. However, along there's a line of first order phase transitions uh, as indicated here. The easing model is a bit simpler or considerably simpler. Uh, it consists of uh, binary uh, Bernoulli variables, uh, plus minus one variables associated with sites of a lattice, like, like say this grid. G is the set, is a, is a graph, uh, vertex set V, H set E, and spins are, fun, are as I said, the uh, uh, binary valued functions over the vertex set. Um, the interaction is given by this uh, easing Hamiltonian, so it's sum over pairs with some coupling constant, sigma x, sigma y, with a negative sign. So that's a ferromagnetic interaction. Um, to lower the energy, the spins, neighboring spins should be in agreement. Um, what to, they can, that it will be both plus or both minus. Uh, the next term breaks the symmetry or removes the symmetry. So it's minus h times sum of sigma x. And if H is non-zero, then, then uh, the spins, uh, to lower the energy, the spins should be in agreement and also of the sign of H. So the interesting most interesting situation is when H is equal to, to zero, in which case there is possibility of symmetry breaking. And such a symmetry breaking occurs. This is the phase diagram of the easing model. So not phase diagram, this is a Sorry, that's a plot of the function of the magnetization, which is the mean value of the spin. The brackets indicate expectation value with respect to the Gibbs measure, as indicated here. And when you take the simplest uh, non trivial observable, which would be the spin, uh, th that's the magnetization. The, the magnetization changes is function of the magnetic field discontinuously at h equals zero with a critical point 
beyond which the discontinuity disappears. So this is a plot of the magnetization as function of temperature at high temperature. So that's the magnetization at zero magnetic field. Um, and it takes off at the critical temperature. So you may think of this line, the, the red switching to blue line is essentially uh, describing in some approximation a local patch of this uh, phase transition of the of the uh, water vapor uh, phase diagram. Uh, remarkably, uh, the critical exponents actually of this very non-trivial system and this sim more simpler looking uh, agree. So uh, it's really delightful that this phenomenon of universality is there because uh, it gives uh, value to the detailed studies of uh, models like the Ising model, which at first glance should be much simpler than, uh, than complex systems like uh, uh, what you get in a, uh, in a bottle of soda. Uh, now, as is famously known, in two dimensions, this model is solvable with nearest neighbor interaction. But that's more or less where the, where the uh, range of solvable model stops. The model is not solvable beyond two dimensions, well, except in the mean field situation interaction, which I would also mention. And yet, you can actually prove rigorously various properties of this phase transition. So I will not go over all that was proven, but just to mention an example, uh, you can show that uh, in any dimension, kind of uh, on a uh, well, uh, that's an amenable graph when you take the infinite volume limit. There exists a critical temperature such that for temperatures above Tc, uh, the, the two point function decays exponentially with finite correlation length. Whereas for temperatures below Tc, they do not decay, they tend to a limit which is non zero and defines the long, uh, the long range order parameter MT. Furthermore, in the vicinity of, so oh, this is the phase diagram. So furthermore, in the vicinity of the critical point, which is located here, the magnetization, which was described here, is singular. And the singularities are described by various critical exponents, uh, which are indicated uh, down here. So as you approach the critical point and think of this as just, I'm copying this, uh, this picture down down here. So there is a critical exponent delta, which describes the rate of vanishing of the magnetization as you approach it from above. Gamma, which is the critical exponent of the magnetic susceptibility. Beta hat is the critical exponent associated with the onset of magnetization, the singularity of this point. So um, it's somewhat satisfying that you can nevertheless even though you cannot solve the model, you can rigorously prove, prove that uh, quite generally, these exponents are bounded why, one way or another by their mean field uh, values. Furthermore, and that's where uh, the phenomenon of upper criticality enters, in high enough dimensions, these inequalities are actually saturated. So the fact that they are saturated was proven for d greater than four actually greater or equal than four, uh, except that in four dimensions, uh, the, the exponents are defined in a way which uh, is blind in a way to logarithmic corrections. So now that it was not proven that the actual behavior is strictly a power law. And in fact, in four dimensions, you have logarithmic corrections uh, uh, to that and the, the, that's so again that's another aspect of the phenomenon of upper criticality so above the upper critical dimension the critical behavior simplifies and also the scaling limit simplifies and as i said becomes gaussian now an object of particular interest for us would be the correlation models correlation functions which are the uh, mean values of products of spin variables. Uh, these are like the Schwinger functions, which I mentioned before, except that now 
they are really correlation expectation values of products of well-defined spin variables. Now, as a so uh, yeah, as a uh, test or measure of deviation or proximity of the system to Gaussian, uh, one may look at this uh, Ursel four-point function U four, which is defined as the uh, difference between the full the expectation value of the product of four spin minus what you would get had this been had this been just Gaussian variables. So you are subtracting from this the sum over all possible pairings, and I'm using the abbreviation where ij means sigma xi times sigma xj, the, cor the correlation function for expectation value of the product. So you subtract from the four point function the corresponding expression, which uh, this would equal to uh, had it been a Gaussian uh, collection of Gaussian variables. And then a measure of deviation from Gaussian behavior is the ratio of this uh, Ursel function U4 uh, to the full uh, product. So, what fraction of the full correlation? deviates beyond what, what you would get had it been Gaussian. Now, due to the griffiths hurst sherman inequality or also Leibovitz inequality, uh, this ratio actually in absolute value is bounded. It's bounded by two. In fact, it's also, uh, it can also be shown to be positive. Again, based, this is just the GHS inequality. So this, this ratio is between zero and two. The fact that it's bounded was used already in earlier work by Grimm and Jaffe to produce what in uh, field theoretic terms we refer to as the Renault upper bound on the renormalized coupling constant. Uh, okay, so we would be very much interested in understanding this ratio and what one way to describe the result is to say that uh, in four dimensions, uh, at large distances, in particular, we are talking about distances which are, we are talking about situation where the correlation length diverges and we are looking at this ratio for distances smaller than the correlation length, but still tending to infinity. This ratio actually tends to zero in dimensions, uh, in high dimensions starting with four. And then not only is this true for the four point function, but actually for the analog of that for all arbitrarily high correlation functions. That, that, that in a way is the result. Now, uh, so the, I now describe both the field theoretic perspective and the stat mech perspective. Uh, I'm a bit worried about the time, uh, but let me say a word about the relation of these two. So notice that the Gibbs measure, which is uh, described here, so it's a, the partition function is sum over all spins uh, with eta minus beta h, and that's the Hamiltonian. You can write the interaction instead of sigma u sigma v, you can write it as sigma u minus sigma v square, because sigma square is constant, is one. And when you write it this way, you see that this actually appears very similar to, to the field theoretic uh, desideratum, which is sum over x the gradient square, that's a good lattice approximation for that, times some non-quadratic function. Well, if you, actually let me switch to the next page. So I'm now describing the, putting to the links between the field theoretic and statistic mechanical perspective. So in statistical mechanics, you are interested in partition function and later in the Gibbs measure, which is the joint, the probabilistic structure of the probability measure based on this, uh, on this uh, integral. So in StatMec, we usually start by writing sum over spins, but you may think of sum over spins as an integral with a, uh, with a, uh, measure over continuous variable sigma u, except that it's multiplied by a delta function weight, which guarantees that, which focuses on the case when sigma is equal to plus or minus one. 
Now, this sort of measure, which is sum of two delta functions, can be realized as, as a limit of uh, soft phi four, phi four measures. So think of the distribution rho sub lambda uh, with a weight given here. So it's lambda times phi square minus one squared plus quadratic term. And when you drive lambda to infinity, this actually collapses onto a pair of delta functions uh, at the zeros of phi square minus one. So there is a trivial relation. Uh, I mean, you can trivially recover the easing model as a peculiar limit of phi four integrals. And what I want to say is that the relation between the phi four system and easing spin system actually goes in both directions. So the first one, which says that if you fully understand phi four models on a lattice, from that you should be able to read also the easing system taking a particular limit, lambda tends to infinity. So it's kind of an infinitely strong, uh, strongly coupled phi four field theory. So that, that's a rather elementary uh, relation. But the relation between the two actually also goes in the other direction. And that was really essential for our work. That is, and that's based on the Griffith Simon representation. So the question is, how do you how do you produce the phi for field distribution out of easing distributions? And here the trick, which is elaboration on an earlier idea of Griffiths, so the Griffith Simon representation, is as follows. Think of, of a collection of easing variables uh, with mean field interactions. I do not draw all of them, but you let all pairs interact equally. This is a, take a finite cluster of such easing spins. Uh, that's a, its Gibbs state is described by a mean field interaction. It has a phase transition. And when you look at the distribution of the block variable, which is sum over the spins within the block, suitably normalized, at the critical point, the distribution of this block variable actually converges to, to, to the phi four measure. It's rather easy to see that I would skip the explanation, but take, take, take the statement at, at its face value. It's, it's not difficult, it's a simple exercise in, uh, in, in effect, in the simple asymptotics of the uh, uh, Sterling formula. Um, so that essentially tells you that you can construct, you can think of the phi four uh, integral in the following amusing way. Think of, of your, each variable phi of u as a block spin. So think of the basic variables u, uh, I mean, we are talking about system of variables phi of u associated with sites. Think of each site as a collection of minuscule easing spin, easing, sorry, variables associated with the, with the sites which populate this, uh, this cluster. It's kind of an ultra local uh, system. So within each lattice site, th think of lattice sites as small boxes. Each box contains many spins. They are coupled internally by mean field interaction. And then there is a, a coupling which amounts to phi u times phi v for neighboring blocks. So in terms of the original easing spins, this corresponds to a system whose couplings are as indicated here. So there are internal couplings within each site and then couplings between clusters. If you understand such easing spin systems taking suitable limits, you can actually uh, produce a phi four integral out of that. And the general result about convergence to Gaussian distribution for easing systems, which we prove, applies to, to beyond the easing model and the phi four model, also to more general distributions of this uh, form. So it's time perhaps to at least state what the result is. So the, the main result is that quantities whose joint distribution we track, uh, the, I'm just repeating here, what's the, uh, what are the variables of interest? It's this sort of aggregates. Uh, well, let me jump here to the result. The theorem is that in four dimensions, uh, as was known already for the greater than four, any random field reachable as an infinite volume scaling limit of finite systems 
at beta less than beta c, uh, limits in which the two-point function converges to a limit uh, which is finite for non-coincidental points and decays to, to zero at infinity, if each such limit is a Gaussian field. That's the, that's the result. So there is a flexibility in uh, how you may want to approach the, the scaling limit, but uh, under these uh, assumptions, the uh, sorry, restrictions, the limit would be Gaussian in four dimensions. And as I said, this is not true below four. Okay, now I should take a, uh, I introduced the two perspectives. I stated the model and I have about 10, so 12, 13 minutes to, to explain a bit uh, the method. Okay, uh, any questions or corrections? Uh, okay, so uh, instrumental for the for the analysis for us has been a representation of the partition function and actually the correlation function in terms of stochastic geometric model, uh, essentially the random current representation. So let me just describe it quickly. The Ising model's partition function which was originally presented as sum over spins of e to the minus beta times the energy of the spin, you can integrate the spins out and re-represent the partition function in terms of sum over even graphs, which essentially can be thought of as unions of loops. Uh, the random objects are now loops, so it's kind of a loop soup model with weights uh, which are product of local factors in terms of these loops. And uh, that's the partition function. Uh, I would, well, actually let me show how this is arrived at. So the partition function is given here. And then you, you may take each of these factors, e to the beta j sigma sigma, take a power series expansion of that. Uh, and then tracing the spins out, you are left with some weight associated with, with the power n, which was used here. So you end up with an expression for the partition function, which is sum over configurations of non-negative of, of integers, integer valued functions defined over the edges. And uh, there is a constraint which you end up with is that this should be they should be even in the sense that uh, the set of sources is empty. So a site X is source for such a configuration. If the net flux, uh, meaning the net, the, the sum of the values of N over edges which are incident on the site is odd. So if there are no sources, the con such a configuration can be presented as a, in a non-unique way but can be represented as a union of loops. For the spin-spin correlation, you obtain a ratio between some of the partition function with, uh, with uh, 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 times the spin, say sigma x1, sigma x2, et cetera, divided by the original partition function. So that leads, that leads to the following ratio. And I, I'm now, I'm a strong believer in uh, the power of pictures. So, let me try just to convey this pictorially. The multi-spin correlation is a ratio between some of our current configurations, which consists of loops plus lines linking the sources associated, which are the sides of the spins, divided by the partition function, which has no such lines. So in a way, the spin-spin correlation is the effect on the integral of the insertion of sources for, for, uh, for these uh, random currents. It's, and now th this is a very powerful picture, I think. If, uh, because, first of all, because it's a non-negative and positivity of functional integral is, a, is an amazingly powerful tool in the right hands. Uh, so in a way, what, the, what you ask yourself is by how much is the weight of this distorted through the insertion, the imposition of long lines. Now, 
it's easy to see that, sorry, sorry, it's intuitive. It's not easy to necessarily to prove unless you have the, you, you realize the trick. Uh, but it's very intuitive that if, if these lines are in some sense dense enough so that typical configurations include percolation of these clusters, then the insertion of sources well, would modify the, the resulting partition, the modified partition function because you are doing something unusual at a couple of sites, but otherwise you cannot locally tell the difference between the, the configuration before and after the insertion. On the other hand, at low temperature, when, when these loops do not percolate, it's a rare event to find connection. The insertion of sources which force connection should reduce the, the total integral into something which is exponentially small relative to the sourceless configuration. And that indeed can actually be shown rigorously to correspond to uh, the phase transition of the system. Now, uh, coming now to the closer to the object of interest for us, which is this ratio between the, uh, the Ursel four point function and the full correlation using a remarkably useful switching lemma, which uh, appeared in the work of Griffiths, Hurst, and Sherman on the GHS inequality. Using the, 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 the argument, one can show that this ratio actually is, can be identified up to factor minus two as the probability in, in a probabilistic system, which consists of, I do not describe here all that is there, but it consists of, uh, of uh, kind of sourceless loops like what I'm now drawing here, plus, uh, plus uh, lines which are forced by sources is the probability that all these sites are interconnected. And again, if you are looking at the critical point where you are on the threshold of percolation, why this is a somewhat complicated object, Essentially, it looks like two decorated by class, two lines, random lines, think of random walk, decorated by clusters. And you are asking for the probability that they intersect. There is a similar relation, uh, if you normalize not by the product of the four, but product of per correlations. And again, you get a very similar uh, expression. Basically, you get probability in a system in which there are two pairs of sources. So necessarily there is a line linking them as well as kind of background loops, which are always present here. It's the probability that, uh, uh, that these, uh, the, the, the connected clusters, that all these sites belong to the same connected cluster. That's an identity. Uh, now time is up, so there are all kinds of other amusing comments which I wanted to make, but I will not. Uh, let me now come to the, you use this representation to, to give some intuition into what's behind the triviality proofs. So out of these relations, you can extract rigorously uh, a number of uh, properties of the model and putting them together, you, you can see what what's so special about four dimensions. So uh, well, the, this is just a reminder which you no longer need of what's a truncated four point function. Uh, by Griffith's inequalities, the expectation value of products of spin is bounded from below by product of expectations. So it's a bit reassuring. It tells us, uh, well, it, it, it's a useful statement. But coming back to the object of interest, which is this four point function, truncated four point function, the Ursel function, the probability, uh, which I just, as I just described is a probability of intersection, the probability that two clusters intersect can be estimated from above by the size of the expectation. Because this, the expected size of the intersection is just sum of the indicator function, which says that a site U is at the intersection of the two clusters. The probability, so basically it's the basic statement that the probability of a union is bounded by sum of probabilities. 
And the union is union of the events that a site, let's call it Y here, is actually connected to all four points disjointly. Well, you will not be totally surprised, but it's a bit of a magic that one can actually prove such things rigorously without any fudge factors. This probability is bounded by sum over the sites Y of the product of probabilities that Y is connected to X1, X2, X3, and so forth. Out of that, you end up, you, you arrive at the tree diagram bound, which says that the truncated four point function is dominated by the diagrammatic sum where uh, the, the picture which is associated with this, the, sorry, with each such, such contribution, you should associate product of these functions. Let us now estimate how big is it? Well, you, you have to know something about the rate of decay of the two point function. And here we, we make use of the extremely important clever, useful, I, I do not have enough adjectives to describe it, the uh, Gaussian domination bound, which was derived by Frederick Simon and Spencer first, then the two point, and then elaborated by Sokal, and we added a bit to this too in our paper, that the two point function uh, in the absence of long range order decays as, at least as fast as the green function of the Laplacian. So this decay is like one over x minus y to the d minus two. For those who did not yet think enough about random walks, this is, this is like the probability that a walk starting at x actually reaches y. Uh, the fact that it decays as d minus two and not some other number has to do with the fact that the trajectory of a random walk is two dimensional in effect. So there's much to say about this formula, but that's, that's a basic result about just the two point function. <laughs> The question now is how to learn about the endpoint functions. Well, just do simple dimensional estimate on what you have here, allowing yourself to think about the situation where the functions do not change by a lot as you say multiply the distance by a factor of two. Then what you have, when you look at the ratio of U4 compared with the straight forward product, expectation value of the product, in the three diagram bound, oh sorry, that's an inequality, not in not inequality. In the three diagram bound, what you learn is that, well, I guess it's first of all, you have a sum. This would give you, if, if all these distances are of comparable distance L, the sum would give you a factor of L to the D. I'm talking about the, this sum. Then in the three diagram bound, you have four per correlation functions. So it's like the correlation function at distance L to the power four. Whereas in the denominator, the product of four spins, roughly speaking, if to the leading order, it's comparable to product of two correlation, two per correlations, say the maximal pairing. But that essentially would give you a two point function squared. So the ratio of that combined with this uh, D minus two power, it's a simple dimensional counting produces, leads you to conclude that this ratio of interest is dominated by, well, you go through the sequence of estimates, one over L to the D minus four. Aha, something happens here when D crosses four dimensions. Uh, for D greater than four, just as the probability of intersection of two independent random walks vanishes in the limit when you take the far apart, this spin correlation would go to zero. The, sorry, this ratio would go to zero. And that's essentially the guiding idea of the previous proof of triviality above four dimensions. For four dimensions, that's insufficient because A to the D minus four tells us that this is bounded by a constant. Well, we knew that before because we have this representation of, the, of that ratio as a probability of intersection. So in four dimensions, this does not, that's totally inconclusive. So that's, I'm, I'm now getting essentially to the point where I, where things were uh, uh, in the eighties. And uh, in the eighties, I was about the age that uh, Hugo Dumil Copin is now, uh, but he wasn't born then yet. 
uh, now that we joined forces, actually we managed to go over that, that hump. And now let me, if I may spend a minute on that, uh, on this argument, just outlining it. Uh, what we are interested in is this ratio of the four point function to, uh, to the expectation value of four spins. And as I said, this is equal exactly to probability that, uh, that the two clusters, I'm skipping a bit, I'm, I'll be a bit sketchy about what exactly is the probability, but it's over a system in which you inserted two pairs of sources and therefore you have two long lines, but these are not simple work, but rather more complicated decorated clusters, is the probability that they intersect. Now, as I said, the above bound is obtained by estimating the size of the intersection. So if I call the intersection, let's call it, uh, uh, let, let me call it X. Let, let this be the size of the intersection, cluster of one, two intersect cluster with three, four size of that, let X be this. What we are talking about is the probability that this variable X is non-zero. And that is certainly less or equal than the expected value of X. But you may be missing some, so that, that's the estimate which, which worked for D greater than four. However, there are situations in which a random variable asymptotically has, uh, uh, let's see, uh, sorry, uh, knowing that the expectation value is of order one, leaves you still uncertain as to whether it's of order one because there may be, that with positive probability there is intersection, but then it's finite, or there is no intersection typically. However, with small probability when an intersection occurs and when it happens, it's very large. So what, 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 we, what was done now is to show that when the intersection happens, it actually is logarithmically large. And the key for that was that uh, what you really want to show is that the expected value of the size of the intersection, given that it's non-empty, uh, is uh, bounded by constant over something resembling log of L or perhaps log L to some power. And that's the reason now to prove that one actually we, 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 we utilized a kind of multi-scale and sort of analysis in which uh, you, are prod you are studying the size of the intersection. We show that when the intersection occurs, if the, if the intersection occurs at a site, then if you draw kind of concentric annuli expanding from that site, there will be intersection, almost surely there will be many other intersections uh, totaling essentially log of the number of scales. So in the fraction of the scales, there, there will be additional intersections. So if you know that intersection, whenever they occur, they are very ample from the fact that the mean value is finite, you can conclude that actually there is almost surely, sorry, then in probability, the probability of intersection tends to zero. That is the structure of the argument. Uh, so the technical details can be found in, in the paper, which is on the archive. And the last thing which I would say is that the random current representation uh, turns out to be useful. As I said, it's valid on all graphs and it actually has also been useful in low dimensions, uh, but I do not have time to describe its application there. So uh, that's essentially the main message up to the details, which, it's, which uh, I will not be able to describe now. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for the beautiful talk. Um, uh, I forgot which order um, we're going about, whether questions or applause is first, but so let's do the applause first. Um, so everyone can unmute themselves. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, okay, so I, I suppose now there's uh, time for questions. Um, um, anyone would like to start? I have a question, Erhard Seiler. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, Michael. Yeah. Um, yeah, I asked that your <laughs> collaborator as well. I mean, uh, the technique is such that it apparently cannot be used uh, if you approach the critical point from the low temperature side. That's my first question. Or do you see any chance? Uh, I, I, I am not as hopeless uh, somehow. Uh, uh, notice that, the, that uh, in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, an early example of the infrared bound and of the reflection positivity bound was actually one of your papers on field theory. And uh, the information which the bound provides is actually on the truncated two point function. So, yes. uh, so I, for that reason, I am uh, not hopeless about that, but it uh -huh. was not uh, spared. So it would be, it would require to go beyond what we said, but I don't think it's hopeless. Okay, thank you. The second question refers to the situation like we have in the standard model, where uh, the phi to the four actually has an internal symmetry, like in the Higgs field would be an SU2 doublet. Well, if there's any kind of internal symmetry, uh, do you see any chance of uh, extending your method to that? Um. <laughs> uh, uh. It's very really fascinating that you are asking it because we are now actually thinking very hard about uh, another of your pet problems, which is trying to understand the nature of correlations of uh, ON models in two dimensions. So I do not, at, at present, I do not see uh, the extension of these methods, but again, I, I would not be totally, well, no, let's see. The random, oh no, sorry, the random current, let me be less optimistic. The random current representation works marvelously if you have an effective description of your random variables in terms of these binary uh, variables. Okay. But there is more to life than that. So there are situations where there are continuous symmetry, internal symmetry plays a role. And it's possible to learn certain uh, some information from binary representations of continuous variables, but I, I think that the power of the method would be diminished in that situation. So for example, I, I'm not aware, uh, then let me also comment that uh, once we learn kind of the uh, power of the three diagram bound, three diagram upper bounds uh, were also derived for uh, other representations of the phi for system, so the work of Froelich uh, uh, and then uh, Bridges uh, for Spencer. Uh, but actually for our analysis, it's very important that you have not only an upper bound, but also lower bound in terms of the uh, intersection properties. So that, for example, this, the analog of that was not derived at using other representations. So the short answer to your question is no, I do not see yet an approach for uh, continuous models. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else? Um. Uh, yeah, I may ask a question. Oh, hi, John. May I ask a yeah. question? Hello. Yeah, I did not exactly understand. Where do you get this one over logarithm L bound? Okay, that... Uh, that's crucial, of course. But that's, that's absolutely crucial, because basically, going back to... Uh, going back to the three diagram inequality, uh, so the... It actually, uh, it took a bit of magic, but at the end it's actually rather elementary to, to derive the, the three diagram bound. The, 
that bound is now improved yeah. by adding in four dimensions something of the form uh, uh, constant over log L to some power in four dimensions. That's the that's the significant uh, uh, let's see. improvement. Yeah. Uh, that, that's that's the improvement which makes it work for uh, four dimensions. So the question is where is it coming from? Uh, this has to do well. Let, let me put it this way. Uh, let, let me try to make some space here. Uh, to present it, perhaps I should write a simple equality. The the probability, sorry, the probability that a variable x, say an integer valued variable, is not zero, can be written as the ratio, if I'm not mistaken, that's, that may be exactly true. It's the ratio between the expected value uh, over the expectation value of x, given that x is non-zero, right? Uh, just yeah. right? Yeah, sure. Should, should the factor to the left side, and then you see it's okay. a trivial identity. So now, the expected value of x the, of the intersection, that's a three diagram bound. And we correct it by producing a lower bound on the conditional expectation of x given that the intersection is not empty. And it's not exactly how it is spelled, but, but the idea of that is that if you, if you condition on the, on the intersection being non-empty, it's a little bit, it's related to not exactly the simple conditioning is to say that you have an, let's condition on the fact that a particular point Y is at the intersection of these two lines. Yeah. So what you're conditioning on is that there exists a pair of, there's a current which runs from X1 to Y continues to X2, and another one which runs from X3 to Y continues to X4, mm -hmm. roughly speaking. And then in this situation, what you want to show that condition on that the expected number of scales at which there is an additional intersection diverges logarithmically. And the probability that there is an intersection in the particular scale would be given by, by something like the bubble diagram. Yeah. And well, then you are in the, in fact, the statement we proved is a bit weaker. We say the following, there is either an unexpected correction in the two point function by which the bubble diagram converges, but that would lead to another form of improvement of the bound, or else uh, the bubble diagram in four dimensions behaves as the sum of one over x square squared, and that thing four dimensions is divergent. So it's from this divergence of the bubble diagram in four dimensions that you get logarithmic correction for the denominator. I see, but I, I did not quite understand. In your diagram, in what you drew there, what are you looking for in, in, in the diagram here? I mean, I don't know if you see the, the, the you, what is this, uh, what are these circles with these? Oh, so I, so I, I draw, I, the picture is not good enough because it's not easy for me to draw many logarithmic, many kind of many terms in a geometric series. Think of a geometric series of annuli, annuli which yeah, are just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. and then for each of, each of these annulus, I would ask whether, given that the random paths intersected at y, whether there is another intersection within that annulus. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now the statement would be that again, assuming that the two-point function does not have in itself is given by exactly the power law. Under this assumption, you show that the expected number of distinct different annuli, the expected number of annuli centered, centered at y, in which there is an additional intersection given that one occurred at y, the expect, this, this expectation is logarithmically large. I see. Okay, it's kind of a multi scale component kind of. Uh, added to this analysis. Okay. So that, that really, and that's really, uh, as you see, this, this would not be, in fact, 
this term would not be, there will be no such logarithm in dimensions greater than four because then the bubble diagram is convergent. So yeah, this, yeah. this is really due to the divergence of the bubble diagram in four dimensions. Okay. If it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Michael. Are there any further questions? Yeah, hi. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, so from a PDE's perspective, it would be kind of natural to ask if this uh, extends to other scalar theories. So for instance, you have this result for 544, right? So does this also extend to uh, 563, I guess, so in, in three dimensions? or to like an exponential nonlinearity in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, at present, I'm not familiar. I'm not aware of any such extension. It uh, okay. really uses. Uh, uh, but let me let me say that uh, uh, just a second. Yeah, I, I should uh, I should this this point should be explored a bit more. Uh, what we are using here is the fact that uh, uh, that the single spin measure can actually be manufactured out of uh, ferromagnetically coupled minuscule binary variables. Now, any such measure inherits some properties of the Ising model, in particular the Li Yang property, a point which was very nicely studied by Chuck Newman. So I. I have to scratch my head now whether the phi to the six model has the Young property, I'm not sure. If it does not, then certainly the method which I'm talking about would not apply. Okay. Curiously, uh, the relation with the Young property appeared earlier on in the work of uh, Chuck Newman, who used it very nicely to show that uh, for models with this property, the scaling limit Triviality is equivalent to just triviality of the, the level of four point function. Uh, we kind of, uh, the analysis which we carry out produces uh, the, that conclusion without Liang property, but still it's, it's in the background. So I'm not sure whether, uh, you know, where would five to the six, for example, fit. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe, maybe I could add to that. Um... I think the question depends on the inter. I mean, what is your interpretation of the triviality statement of the phi six and uh, three dimensions? So, if you look at the four dimensional phi four case, you're always allowing a phi square term to take to be tuned to any value you like. If in the phi six model you allow the phi to the four and a phi square term to be tuned to any value you like, you can obtain the three dimensional easing fixed point. Uh, as a scaling limit, at least conjecturally. So the result will not, not be true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, in low dimensions, models uh, tend to have non-trivial scaling limit and you have to, to force triviality by adjustment of parameters to really, I mean, the models are asymptotically free in low dimensions, right? So tiny, Tiny deviation from uh, strict Gaussianity would propagate into uh, meaningful uh, renormalized coupling constant. So just, it's it's. Uh, I think at Roland's uh, comment is well taken. I I just have to say that I find this very interesting because like I come more from a PD background and like normally whatever you think is true for the let's say quintic wave equation in three D, you also think is true for the uh, cubic wave equation in three D and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So the, the fact that like the kind of Gibbs measures seem to behave differently seems very interesting to me. Um, well, I, I think in this, this uh, what, what you're saying, what you're building in there is that you've already constructed a, a yeah, non-trivial yeah. continuum limit somehow. Yeah. And then uh, in three dimensions, I think that problem is just a bit more subtle in the sense that yeah. if you want to exclude the, uh, the po I mean, you cannot exclude the possibility because uh, because at least there's uh, conjecturally the, the, the non-Gaussian easing fixed point. 
So in a way, what you are asking about is adding phi to the six without any of the phi to the fourth spin-offs from that. I, yeah. But since Roland is uh, is here, I, I want to say that uh, one of the interesting open challenges is to uh, to see whether one could uh, lay one's hands on the magnitude of the logarithmic corrections of phi four in four dimensions. And Roland knows all about uh, yeah. that if you study it in, for soft enough uh, phi four field models. And one of the questions here is also universality of that. Namely, is it true that, uh, say, the scaling limits of critical uh, soft uh, phi four fields models is the same as that of the hard easing system? I think that we are not there yet. Does your method give any? Um, does your methods give uh, non-trivial bounds on the logarithmic corrections? Uh, or I think, or your your. Not yet. Uh, not yet. Not. Uh, I mean, it does. It does, but they are too ugly to to state. Mm -hmm. uh, you are asking bounds about say the powers, the one third. Yes, for example. Uh, I mean, there's some upper and lower not there bounds. Yet. No, we are not, no, not there yet. It would be very interesting to to try and to develop a rigorous, uh, say, beta function analysis using these methods. That, that was not. We are not there yet. Okay. Uh, any any further questions or? Well, if, if not, uh, I suppose it would be customary to thank the speaker again, and then uh, um, we will resume uh, uh, ne next year. Um, so I guess uh, I suppose everyone can unmute again. And uh... thank you, and best wishes for the new year. Let it be better. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Same to everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much.